As I said, Romans chapter 6, Lord willing, we are going to make it from 15 to the end of the chapter, 15 through 23. Again, in that later section of Romans chapter 5, we just we kept seeing this contrast of being in Adam and in Christ, and all people are in Christ, but only those who profess faith in Christ, all people are in Adam, but all those who trust in Christ are in Christ. Being in Adam means that all people, people are sinners by nature and by choice. And we're guilty because we are under Adam, and he was the representative of all humans. And even though there was one sin that brought condemnation on all of us, there also have been billions and billions of sins, but one act of righteousness by Jesus brings justification and righteousness to all who would believe. Amen. So where there is a great amount of sin, grace abounds. So we saw last week in the first part of chapter 6, so then the logical question the Apostle Paul asked then is, well, if grace abounds where there's a bunch of sin, then shouldn't we just keep on sinning? Answer? No, by no means, ain't no way. And he went on to say that this illustration, he showed this illustration of baptism. And how we have died. That's why when we do baptism, we go into the water. Died with Christ. And as we've died in Christ, with Christ, we're raised to the newness of life. And he says, if if you've died to something, how can you continue in it? You can't. We rejoice because we're to walk in the newness of life and we're no longer enslaved to sin. We continue to talk a little bit more about that we must consider ourselves dead to sin. My encouragement to you is you have to think about this. That's the reality for a Christian. You are dead to sin. But we forget that. We're forgetful people. We think that it has some power over us. The glorious gospel of Jesus Christ sets us free from the penalty of sin and the power of sin. And when you die... To go be with Jesus, you will be away from the presence of sin forever. So my encouragement to you was, you need to use your bodies as instruments of righteousness. I also encourage you that you need to burn the ships. The ships that are in your life that tempt you to stay back instead of following Jesus. And like Captain Cortez did for his men, burn those ships so they have no choice but to move forward. Get those things out of your life. Or perhaps those people. I told you you must remember that you are under law. You are not under law, rather, but you are under grace. Which leads us to verse 15. Paul has just said, sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law but under grace. Follow along silently as I read starting in verse 15. What then? Are we to sin because we are no, are not under law but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey? either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. For when you were slaves to sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, 
The fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. <laughs> Paul's asking the question in, first, in verse 15. What then? I understand, Paul's saying, I get it. I know you guys, I just told you guys that you're dead to sin. No more power over you. So here's the temptation. No power over me. But there's some things that are sinful that are intriguing. They're a bit interesting. They feel good. I remember doing them long ago, or maybe not that long ago. I enjoyed it. At least some. I'm not under the, the power of it anymore, so I could do it. This is, well, I'll tell you what this looks like. Looks like when you're on a diet. Hey, uh huh. And you say, man, I'm doing well. I'm going to have me a cheat day. You know, about, you know about the cheat day, don't you? Some of you cheat day turns into cheat week. And then cheat month. That's what this is. It's, I'm disciplined. I'm good. I'm just going to have a little bit. And there's a reason that New Year's comes around. and we go, I'm, I'm starting to diet soon. At least I thought you started. Yeah, well. Mind your own business. <laughs> I'm not under the power anymore. I'm not under the law. I'm under grace. So I can dabble a little bit. Paul's answer? By no means. Do not do it. No way. Why, Paul? Why not? Verse 16. Paul says this. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey? Either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. He's going to say here, now, now don't you know that if you start to go down that road, even if you think this is my choice, I've got this under control, you're falling back under that master of yours. Whatever you obey, that's your master. And see what Paul is saying is you have a new master. Don't even go down that road. You start to go down that road. What you're saying is, that's my master. You may think, oh, no, no, he's not my master. I'm just doing what he wants me to do because I want to do it. <laughs> no, it's your master. But that's been broken. So he's saying, don't get over there. Don't be a part of that. Because here's what happens. You're obeying sin and not repenting of it and battling it. That road leads to death. And sometimes we think, I'm good. I'm okay. No power over me. And this is that road that leads to death. But here's what's happening. It's like an escalator. And you're on it. And yeah, I'm walking, but it's also pulling you at the same time. And you may think you're okay. We're going to find out some more marks of a true Christian this morning. But what you don't realize is you're nodding. Even if you're like, oh, I'm good. It's all right. I'm good. It has no power over me. It's taking you. What Paul is saying, go the other way. Walk the other road. The road of obedience to Christ, which leads to righteousness. This road leads to death. This road leads to righteousness. Verse 17, 
Look what he does, though. But thanks be to God. Where does he go? He praises God right away. Because of God's grace in your lives, God's work in your heart, God's spirit living inside of you. But thanks be to God that you were once slaves to sin. You who were once slaves to sin have become obedient, look at this, from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. A couple of different things I want to point out here. He is praising God that they were once slaves to sin, but now look, they have become obedient, but where? From the heart. Don't miss that. Don't miss that because that's where you see true Christianity. If you haven't had a heart change, then you're obeying for another reason. Let me tell you some of the reasons. You're obeying because of the social norms or the family norms around you. It's what your family does. It's what the society, your friends, they're all Christians. They follow God. They do these things. So you do those things so you can fit in with them. That's really your motivation. Another reason? You're still trying to work your way. You're trying to work your way to righteousness. So you're trying to obey. I got to obey. I got to obey. I got to obey. It's not from the heart. You don't have a changed heart yet. What the Apostle Paul here is saying is, if you don't have a changed heart, then you're not going to get it. Some of you obey. You know why? Fire insurance. You obey because you're scared of hell. And you should be. It's real. God wants obedience because you love him. How, how would that go in a marriage? I'm married. Heather needs to love me because she fears me only. That's not good. We don't want that kind of relationship. Is there a proper fear of the Lord? Yeah, you bet. But it needs to come from a changed heart. So when you obey, it's because you want to. We read at the beginning of the service, 1 John chapter 5. Here's how John will say it. 1 John 5, beginning in verse 1. Everybody who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of Him. By this we know... That we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. I don't know if I love God. I'm not sure if I'm a follower of yours. Do you love him and obey his commandments? But look at this, verse 3. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. This is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. But, he doesn't stop there. And his commandments are not burdensome. That's interesting. Ah, but it's really hard to follow. He didn't say it's not hard. It's not, a, it's not a burden to you. You joyfully want to obey. Not, well, I have to obey God. I have to go to church. I have to give my money. I have to. No, no, I get to. I get to. Because he's changed me. And the stuff that I, I used to do, I'm not really that interested in that anymore. He's changed me. And now I'm like, ooh, I want to read my Bible. People are like, what? No, let's go fit. No, i got to read my Bible. I'm excited to see what Jesus is going to tell me today. You're changed. Well, yeah, that's the point. If you've become a Christian and everyone's like, hey, you're the same as you've always been. Ha ha. Ooh. Oh, good. Old Debbie. There she is. Same as she's always been. Oh, oh Lord. By God's grace, you're different. What you desire is different. I want to be with God's people. I want to pray. I want to read his word. And if that's not there for you, you need to ask God to show you if you really know him. There are times that we walk in sin and our hearts get these calluses on it. But a true believer will repent 
work of God's Spirit in you, you will repent. You will not continue on that escalator. Back over to Romans. He thanks God that they were once slaves to sin, but now they've become obedient to the heart. And don't miss this, to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. You know the word commitment? Does that sound like a pretty passive word? Just laid back. Not really going to try. Just kind of do whatever I want. To be committed to something, there needs to be action, right? Intentionality. Notice what Paul says here. Your growth, your obedience to Christ, it's going to be linked to the standard of teaching to which you're committed. If you're not very committed to growing in Christ, guess what? You're not going to obey very well. You're not. You have to be committed to God's people, to prayer, to his word, and that's what the Spirit will use to produce obedience in you. Some of you also need to hear this, and then we have some, some guests here today, so if this offends you, oh well. <laughs> Obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching. Some of you are being taught by very bad teachers. I did a sermon a while back on false teachers, and yes, I named names. Go online, listen to it. I don't care. They're false teachers. You shouldn't be listening to them. And then there are some that are shallow teachers. How many of you want a shallow Christianity? Nobody would say that. But if you're in a church, or you're listening online to people that are just kind of surfacy, how deep your Christianity is going to go. You need to be committed to deep study, deep teaching. And if you're here and you're like, this guy isn't very deep, good, find another church then. Find somewhere that will go deep. Because again, that's where obedience is going to come from. The Spirit will use the deep things of the Word and He will uncover these beautiful jewels and you'll see these jewels and you'll say, oh, I want to obey God. But if you see it's not really worth it, it's just shallow. I'm reading a book right now on deep discipleship, and here's his claim, and I think he's spot on. There are people that have been leaving the church in the United States for many years now. We see churches shrinking. We see people leaving. Here's his claim. It's not that we're asking too much of people. We're asking too little. They're going somewhere else. They're looking for meaning. And then there's a whole bunch of people that are going to mega churches. And don't hear me wrong. There are some mega churches that are teaching the word of God and deep teaching. That happens. And then there's a whole bunch that you just go and get your ears tickled. And you feel good. And there's no deep teaching. Brothers and sisters, be very careful about the standard of teaching that you're putting yourselves. And men, listen carefully to me. You are responsible for your families and what teaching they are receiving. You lead in that as well. But thanks be to God that you, who were once slaves to sin, have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free, verse 18, from sin, having become slaves of righteousness. Look at this. We're, we're no longer slaves to sin, right? We're free. Yes. You actually have a new master. You're not free to do whatever you want. You're now free to do what you should. You are a slave to righteousness, a slave of Christ. It's not now, well, I'm no longer a slave to sin. I'm going to do whatever I want. Life is good. I'm under grace. It's, yeah, that's true. But don't forget this side. Master, what do you want me to do today? Master, what's my marching orders? Who is it that I need to love today? Serve. Let me go to the Word to get my marching orders and know what I'm supposed to do. How many of you think it would be okay to your master if he says, I want you to do this, this, and this, and you go, hmm, don't really feel like it. 
You don't understand. And yes, the word is slavery. It looks a little different than what we had, of course, here in the United States and other places. But make no mistake, you are owned by Jesus. If you don't like that, I don't think you know him. Here's your choice, owned by sin or Jesus. Oh, Jesus is the perfect master. A master who would die for you. That's one that I'll gladly serve from the heart. You have been set free and you are slaves of righteousness. Verse 19, now look at this. Thanks for this, Paul. I'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. <laughs> I studied this and read that and listened to that over and over, and every time I'm just like, thanks, Paul. It's like, I'm just going to have to give you, a, you know, an analogy here. You're naturally limited. <laughs> no, but it, what he's saying, of course, is we try to use analogies to understand things. And nothing can fully explain God, of course, or everything about Christianity, but this is helpful. It's something they would understand at that time. We can understand at this time. I'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your mem members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more look at this, leading to more lawlessness. That goes back to that escalator. When you get on that thing and you get into sin, guess what? It's going to keep taking you. It's going to keep going, dragging you further and further. Some of you like to go fishing. Cast it out there. Got the bait on the hook. For some of you, you do a great job and you use the right bait. <laughs> you get a fish on there. And, and you ever had this? You're fishing and the fish is actually swimming towards you. Like, I don't think I've got anything on here. This is crazy. <laughs> oh, wow, there it is all of a sudden. That's what we're doing when we're just, oh, yeah, I just love sin. We're just going towards it. We're going towards it. And all of a sudden we go, oh, wait a second, wait a second. And it's just mm, pulling you. It leads to more unrighteousness. Don't dabble in it. Not even a little. On the other side, though, look what the text says. Go back to it. Leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness. I was slave to a sin, and I would present my members over here. Now I'm a slave to righteousness, leading to sanctification. Sanctification, the way we summarize that here is you look more like Jesus. Present yourself that direction. Guess what? There's an escalator going that way, too. Get on it. And every once in a while, we're heading the right direction, and we kind of fall. Guess what? The escalator's still moving. We even sometimes go, oh, I'm going to go this way. <laughs> but by his grace, we're still moving. You know why? Because part of following Jesus means we repent of sin. That's part of that journey. So we keep moving. So if you go this way, it's going to keep taking you. You go this way, it's going to keep taking you. You have a choice to make. Which road are you going to walk down? Which master are you going to serve? Verse 20, for when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. You were not under righteousness. You were, you were not controlled. You were not owned by righteousness. You didn't do anything righteous. You were free in regard to that. But, verse 21, the fruit, but what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of now which you are ashamed? It says, before when you were under sin and you were doing those things, what was the fruit of that? Pretty stinky. Bad fruit. You ever bitten into a bad piece of fruit? Oh. He says, I know it can be tempting to go back to that. Don't dabble in it. Think about it. It ruins your life. It leads to death. Stay away from it. For the end of those things is, what does it say? Death. The question is, do you believe that? When you go to look at whatever you should not look at on the internet, when you think about that other person, when you're tempted to gossip or lie, whatever it is, just think immediately, this thing leads to death. If someone was following you around with a gun and holding it to your head every time you were about to sin and you looked over and saw the gun there, you'd go, oh, mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you the truth in this situation. I'm not going to tweak my little my little truth, into a, a white lie, which that must be okay. Mm -mm. If we could see the seriousness of it, as Paul is saying, we would live lives that look different. But we forget. Every time you are tempted, you need to think, this thing leads to death. And then you'll go, mm-mm, 
not interested in that. Or maybe you are. How many of you like to die? Who, wanna, who wants to die? And one says, you're like, well, wait, that's a trick question. I get to be with Jesus. Wait, what's he? No. Yes, we get to go be with Jesus. That's game. But do not take sin lightly. Verse 22, look at this. The end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin, you have become slaves of God. The fruit you get leads to sanctification, becoming more like Jesus. The more you obey, you look more and more like Jesus. And its end, what's its end? Eternal life. That road ends at eternal life. That road leads to eternal death. You have a choice to make. Last verse. Let Paul summarize this for you. Many of you know this verse. For the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Just in case you think that your works are going to be a part of this, he says, let me show you real quick. Let me remind you. I'm going to summarize and remind you. The wages, what you earn is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life. You have one master. He leads to death. And that's what you get. That's your wages. You have another master that you could follow. His road leads to eternal life. And it's a gift. How many of you like gifts? Yeah, you better. Especially if they're good gifts. Let me end with this. I'm going to read out of Psalm 86, 8 through 13 for you. And I'm going to give you five things to take away. Here's Psalm 86, 8 through 13. There is none like you among the gods, O Lord nor are there any works like yours. All the nations you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. Look at this. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. You hear that? Unite my heart, asking God to do it. I give thanks to you, O Lord, my God, with my whole heart, and I will glorify your name forever. For great is your steadfast love towards me. You have delivered my soul from the depths of Sheol. Five things. Number one, remind yourself daily that you are a slave to Christ. Wake up. Look in the mirror. Put it on a notepad, a sticky note, something. And say, you're a slave to Christ. I'm a slave to Christ. If you have other people around you, they're followers of Jesus, let them know. Hey, you're a slave to Christ. You can say, you can tell them you you love them as they're going out the door. Remind them they're a slave to Christ. Second thing, do not dabble. Don't dabble. Don't get over there and dabble in sin. Stay away. Wake up, I'm a slave to Christ and I ain't going to dabble. That's what you need to be thinking. Ride the escalator to glory. As you're stepping out the door, if you want to, say, I'm getting on the escalator to glory. Here I go. Don't get on the other one. I promise you, it doesn't go where you want it to. Often commit yourself to deep teaching. If you need help with that, let us help you. We have a lot of resources, a lot of suggestions for you. Fifth, praise your master for his gracious gift. Amen?